So I got a message this morning saying, please come and help. And as you can hear, I'm battling a bit. It's not because I sang my voice away, it's because I'm battling a bit. I, was, I got sick uh, during a holiday Bible club and, and I got better. And it, well, I just came to give me another visit. So I'm battling just to get rid of the last of it. So please be patient with me this morning if my voice is a little bit croaky. It's not because I've been shouting at my wife. I love her. It was her birthday in the week, as was it Pastor Frank's birthday. And uh, Rabina Page was yesterday, and I'm sure there's some other people that I've missed. And that's why we're trying to avoid mentioning names. But I just want to say that today, I'm so much younger, because um, my wife is now two years older than me now, rather than just one. <laughs> For six months of the years. She's got a young bookie, <laughs> and I'm married to a Sessa member. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm sick uh, Anyway, let's get serious again. Isn't it amazing how God has been moving here this morning, church? Yo, two amens. Did the rest of you not notice it? God's presence has been phenomenal here, and there's a very clear trend uh, Conrad said, as he used that scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11, the plans of God good, the prophetic word that came out. And Conrad, you, you, you're right, because you started out of my, my, that same scripture. No, it's the Holy Spirit. He's speaking to us. When a scripture starts coming up over and over and again, then you must know that God is speaking to you. So it's in the message this morning. So this morning, I can tell you, I am... Um, Aside from my daughter writing to me, say, Dad, I need to help on the worship team. Um, I could quite easily have handed my message over to, to somebody else to preach because, um, yeah, and, and, and just stayed in bed. But don't worry, I'm not spreading germs. I'm not sneezing and coughing all over everybody. But it's on, yeah, like something going on in here. It's a big seer. But um, I believe the word this morning is important. And, um, you know, last week we heard about the focus of the Holiday Bible Club and we heard about the rescuer. And then uh, Kathy said she's been teaching uh, the, the teens about the safe harbor. You know, uh, Jesus is our safe harbor. In fact, church is a safe harbor. It's a safe place you can come. Too many churches are places where people go and they get hurt. It shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be like that. There should be a place you can come and, and just receive love and nurturing, and be built up. Uh, and I was going to title this message, The Anchor, which is also linked. Um, but as I was preparing it, I thought of something that somebody had said, and, and I renamed it, The Best is Yet to Come. The Best is Yet to Come. And for Christians, the best is yet to come. I once read a story about a little boy who, when his parents asked him, what he wanted for Christmas, he said, I want a pony. And they looked at each other and they said, well, we'll think about it. They answered very wisely because who promises their child a pony? <laughs> I mean, it's not really very practical, is it? Anyway, they obviously thought about it. And this little boy, this was long before Christmas, and all he could talk about was the pony he's going to get at Christmas time. And finally, Christmas Day arrived, Christmas morning um, arose, uh, arrived and this little boy got up out of bed and very excitedly he went and looked out the window because he was fully expecting to find a pony somewhere in the yard. But alas, there was no pony. So he was a bit disappointed. But anyway, it was Christmas morning and he got up and he ran down the stairs and there they had a, a tree and there were presents under the tree. So he asked his mom and dad, please, 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 can I open it? I see there's a present for me. Can I open it? He was so excited about this present that was under the tree with his name on it. And they gave him permission. I mean, how can you keep a child from doing that? We all did it. We made them wait, didn't we? <laughs> Teach them patience. But actually, it's just because once the excitement's, uh, the presents open, all the excitement's over. So you want to s s nurture that moment and, and savor it for a while. Anyway, this little boy got to his prison and he ripped it open and there was a box. And uh, he looked at this box and he thought, now what's in this box? So he took the lid off and inside it was just a clump of hay. And this little boy said, hooray, hooray, hooray. And his mom and dad looked at each other and thought, oh, what? Well, and they said to him, now why are you so excited? He said, if there's hay, if you put hay in this box, there must be a pony here somewhere. 
So, this little boy had hope. There was hope. If there was hay in the box, there was hope that there's a pony somewhere. And uh, all that he needed to believe that there was a pony was just to see that bit of hay in a box inside the house. And that's what hope is. Hope is a feeling of expectation and desire about something that you are looking forward for it to happen. That's hope. That's what hope is. An expectation based on a future event or occurrence, something that you're expecting to happen. I recently heard somebody say something like this when preaching. In fact, I've heard it more than once in a sermon. Somewhere in the future, sorry, there goes my voice. I look far better than what I do right now. What a statement. What a statement. Somewhere in the future, I look better than what I do right now. Now, I look pretty good right now. I mean, look at this nice jacket. I've got a brand new jersey on. I've got a shiny head. <laughs> I'm just joking. <clears throat> Somewhere in the future, I look a lot better than what I do right now. What a statement. Right now, things may be going very well for you. You may have your health, good job, lots of income. Your family's happy. Everything's going well. How can the future look better? Alternatively, right now, you could be in a place where things are really, really going bad. Things are falling apart at work. You're sick. People are picking on you. It feels like, where is my tomorrow? And for those people, you could picture a better future quite easily. In fact, you go to sleep tonight and you hope for a better day tomorrow. That's hope. That's what hope will do for you. And I believe that that prophetic word was for each and every person this morning. Because God says he's here to meet us in our needs, didn't he? He gave us such amazing, I think, and you know, we do record the services. Good morning to those that are online with us. I so often forget to greet you. But this recording goes on Facebook and it remains there. So if you didn't get it, just go and find, search this church out on Facebook and go and find and go and listen to that prophetic word again. It's worth listening to again because there were some very clear promises that came through in the prophetic word this morning. And you'll hear more about it as I go on in the message. But hope is something where we hope that tomorrow our circumstances will be better. We hope that somewhere in the future we will look better, feel better, manage better, and be better than what we are right now. We hope that our circumstances will be better. We hope in a bright and a blessed tomorrow. And that's what I want to look at this morning. I want to look at this word hope in the Bible context, what it means to us. And what a big difference it can make in our lives. Can I hear an amen? Amen. So I want you to put your seatbelts on this morning. Strap down because I honestly believe that the Lord has given us a word of encouragement. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning that you've been speaking to us already. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are here. Holy Spirit, you are here. And Lord, not only do we welcome you, you here, but we pray remain here. We want more of you, even as we sing. Lord, we don't want you to leave this place and leave us alone here. And we do not want to leave this place unless you go with us. We thank you for this word that you've given us this morning, the prophetic word, but also the the, the word that is about to be preached. We pray, open our hearts and our minds and our ears and let that word sink in and bring about the transformation that it's meant to bring. Because your word which goes forth is like the rain that comes forth and bears a harvest. It doesn't come back void. So I pray that the word that goes out this morning will produce a harvest in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hallelujah. What is the Christian's hope? Well, let me first read to you this amazing scripture on hope. Hebrews 6 verse 19 from the Amplified Version. Have you got your Bible yet? Do you want to open your Bibles with me? I'm going to read it a bit different because obviously the Amplified amplifies the meaning of the words. And I've often said, if you are battling with a scripture and you're battling to understand it, 
Go and read it in the Amplified Version. You say, I don't have one, Pastor. Well, you find it online. Just go and search Amplified and search the Scripture. Ach, bayranki Erika. You see, that's love in the church. they caring about me. And if there's scriptures, it means that somebody else also battling. So thank you. All right, so the Amplified, it amplifies it. I said go and read the Amplified, but also go and get yourself a new living translation because it paraphrases it into simpler words and makes it easier to understand. Let your go-to Bible, this is my advice, be the New King James Version because the Old King James was the most accurate translation and the New King James is just that in modern words. But then have a look at these other ones that help you to understand the Scripture. Hebrews 6 verse 19. Now... We have this hope, say with me, hope, a a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. That's why I was going to name this message the anchor. It cannot slip and it cannot break down under whoever steps out upon it. A hope that reaches further and enters into the very certainty of, of the presence within the veil. What's the presence within the veil? That's the Holy of Holies. It's where God is found. God the Father is found. Amen. So hope will take us all the way through right to His presence. But I'll, I'll elaborate on that scripture later on. It's going to come up three times in this message this morning. What is the Christian's hope? Well, we can sim- summarize it into these, these three, uh, oh, sorry, seven words from Colossians 1 verse 2. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Say it with me. Christ in me, my hope of glory. That's the Christian's hope. It's a summary. Seven words. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen. He is our hope. Jesus Christ in us is our hope of glory. Glory speaks about eternal, eternity. Our hope for eternity. A Christian's hope comes from the fact that we have invited Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, to live in us. He is our hope of glory. Paul encouraged the people of the Thessalonian church not to be like those who have no hope. We use this scripture when we do funerals. He encouraged the people in the church not to be as those that don't have hope. Why do you think he needed to do that? Because they were grieving when people died in a way that was, it was not meant to be the, 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 the kind of grief that belonged to a Christian who's lost a Christian loved one. And for you and I, if we lose a loved one, while it's terrible and there's pain and there's grief and we will miss them, we do not lose hope. Because if they died in Christ, Christ in me, the? Amen. So it says this, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 to 14. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. I'm not talking about those that fall asleep in church. <laughs> I'm concerned about that, okay? Leave that for the pastor, okay? We're talking about those who have died. They've fallen asleep, all right? Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. As a Christian, we do not sorrow for Christians who do not have any hope. If you know somebody who's died without Christ... You can sorrow in a different way. But let me tell you, it's not for us to judge. Because you don't know if in that person's very last moments they invited Jesus in. Amen. We don't know. And that is why Jesus said we mustn't judge. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. If Jesus is risen... Christ in me, my hope is in glory. If I die, there's going to come a day when Jesus, who rose from the dead, is going to come back with me. Does that make sense, church? So we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Our hope is that we will be resurrected and live eternally. Do you understand that? All of us should understand that. I mean, it's a basic Christian principle, isn't it? Resurrection from the dead. This hope deals with the fear of death. Death, where is your sting? Where is the victor of the grave? It doesn't have victory anymore. If you're living and you're afraid of dying, 
we may be afraid of the unknown, of what we don't know. What is it going to be like to die? What is it going to be like to get ill with an illness that leads to death? We, those kind of things can maybe cause fear. But death itself, you should never be afraid of. And even if you're ill, you shouldn't be afraid of it. Because God will give you grace. What did he say to Paul? He said, my grace is sufficient. So he will help us through those difficult circumstances. Hope replaces the fear of death with a great and wonderful expectation of a better future in God. Say it with me again. I have a better future. Amen. When we walk out of this place this morning, church, I want us to be encouraged. Encouraged in who we are as Christians and encouraged to know that no matter how good or how bad it is right now, there's something in the future that's better than what we have right now. That is the Christian hope. Our best is yet to come. Let me ask you this question. And I want to ask you this because I'm going to give you opportunity to respond to it later on. Do you have that hope? Is that your personal hope, child? I would like to say child of God, but let me rather say congregant, person that's sitting here this morning, those friends, those of you that are here this morning, is that your personal hope? Do you have a hope of a future in Christ? If you don't have Jesus, you don't have that hope. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Because that is what it's going to take to take hold of that hope. There's plenty of examples of hope in the Bible. Let me share just two with you. What about Abraham? Abraham had hope. If you've got your Bibles there still, this is one of my, I don't have favorite verse. I've got lots of favorite verses, but this is one of them. Romans 4 verse 17. I normally quote Romans 4 verse 17 B, the second half of it. But we're reading 4 verse 17 to 18 this morning. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. This is talking about Abraham. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. With God we can call things that do not exist as though they did. You may be sitting here this morning and you can have hope of healing, child of God. Because even though your health may not be good, our God is the God that calls with that which is not as though it is. You may have a bone, a part of your body that is deteriorated and messed up and hurting and not functioning as it should. You've got to hope this morning that God can make that thing new because he makes that which is not as though it is and he even lifts up that which is dead. Amen. That's what we need to hear. Let it sink in, church. It's time we got excited about God's word. It carries on to say, who, Abraham, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Abraham, contrary to hope. What's contrary? Something that's in a position to. Something that's opposite to. All right? My head is contrary to my feet. It's the other side of my body. Abraham, contrary to hope, had hope. Even when there shouldn't have been hope, he had hope. I keep saying it to our congregation, and some of us are aging. Do not accept. We will all die one day. By the, that's what the Word of God says. But don't accept that you have to accept all the sickness and disease and deterioration just because you're getting old. Who said that? Who said that? But we accept it. We start to believe it. And so it gets permission to start taking place in our bodies. I will fight this thing as long as I have breath in my lungs by the Lord's grace. I'm not growing old gracefully. I'm not going to accept deterioration in my body and lie down. Because my God and your God is the one who calls things which is not as though they are. Amen. Sure, I'm going off track. But somebody needed to hear that. Abraham, contrary to the knowledge that having children at his and Sarah's age was nearly impossible, clung to hope. 
He had hope. He had hope because he knew who God was. That God's promise that he would be a father of many nations would be fulfilled. And what happened? It, it, it was fulfilled. You and I, yeah, uh, yeah because of that. Did you know that? Because we are grafted in. We are children of Abraham by faith. Amen. We are Christ, through Jesus Christ, we are children of Abraham. But Abraham had many children. Father Abraham had many sons. Left hand, right hand. Amen. And it's true. I wrote an encouragement during the COVID crisis. And I said this. It may feel like the coronavirus crisis is not coming to an end. We may be experiencing problems that make our circumstances seem hopeless. But like Abraham, contrary to hope, we must have hope in God. He can give life to our seemingly hopeless situations. And he could call what seems to be impossible into being. It seemed like COVID was never going to end. And where is COVID today? It still raises its head down there. But does it have authority? Does it rule and reign? No! We should not have let go of our hope. And I trust that you didn't let go of your hope. And that you won't let go of your hope. Now you open and you see on the internet, no, disease X is the next pandemic. They don't even know what it is. They're already confessing it. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because that's fear of the future. And the child of God doesn't have to do that. He can call what seems impossible into being. That's the God we serve. Look what happened with Abraham. Look what happened to the COVID pandemic. Our hope did not fail us, nor did Abraham's fail him. Another beautiful biblical picture of hope is found in Psalm 30. Psalm 30 verse 5. You know it well. Don't worry, I'll just quote it. You'll know if I'm quoting it right. Weeping may endure for the night, but what comes in the morning? Joy. We have hope in our difficulties, in our problems, the stuff that Shirley gave the word about this morning, that God is there with us. He will help us. And tomorrow will be better because I look better in the future than what I do right now. I'm not just talking about eternity this morning, church. I'm talking about your tomorrow. I'm talking about your five minutes time. Because maybe something will sink into your heart and into your life that will change everything for you. Can I hear an amen? Why? Because we serve the living God. We serve a God that loves us. We serve a God that cares for us. Do you know we were listening, as we always do, we were watching a, a Jensen Franklin message this morning. And he was speaking about loving one another and dealing with our anger. And he used the example of Peter when Peter said, how many times, Peter, I'm going to show what a good fellow I am. We'll forgive seven times. Lord, is that enough? And the Lord Jesus just kind of popped his balloon. Remember me popping the balloon last week? He popped his balloon and said, no, no, not seven times. Seventy times, seven times. And you know what sunk into my heart as he said that? If Christ expects us to forgive that many times, then he's willing to forgive us that many times. Isn't that a reason to give him a praise offering, church? Who is lying under the weight of sin? Go and ask for forgiveness. You'll get it. Because he's not going to ask you to do something he didn't do. Seventy times seven a day. But Lord, I keep messing up. What hope is there for me? That's what Paul said. Oh, wretched man that I am. Uh, Romans chapter 7. What hope is for me? My hope, I praise Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit of God. Amen. We've got hope, church. Hope always speaks of a better future. And God encourages us to, us to have hope for a good future. Have you still got hope, church? Are there people sitting here this morning and they feel like they've lost all their hope? Their problems just go on and on and on and you just want to give up. This message is for you this morning. God wants to encourage you this morning. You need to have hope. We look at our country. I'm on the way here this morning. Oh, I'm away from my message again. It doesn't matter. And I look at these posts, these light posts. And a couple of years ago we saw them. They put them up, beautiful cables, beautiful LED lights. 
Yo, and yeah, two years later, you drive past the posts and the wires are hanging down because they've been stolen. And there's almost no lights because the lights have been stolen. Oh, and we say, oh, there's no hope for this. There is hope for this country, church. Yes, we are in the process of a time of change. It's taking a bit of time and wrangling and everybody finding their place. Don't give up your hope, church. This is the great Southland. Come and pray with us about this country. Come tomorrow night, pray with us. This is a great south land. This is the land where revival is going to spread from and go right through Africa. Amen. We've got hope. We've got a hope because we've got a God, the God of all hope. Amen. Our tomorrow looks better than today. Don't look at all this rubbish. It's naysaying. It's politicking. It's, uh, it's just rubbish propaganda. Stop believing the lies. They say stuff. To, to wind people up and to turn people against other people. It's all politicking. It's about power. Leave it in the Lord's hands. Love your nation. Love your neighbor. Say there's hope for this nation. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you know who the Lord gave that scripture to? Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. The people of Israel, while they were in captivity, they were weeping because they were in captivity. Remember they said, we hung up our harp on the weeping willows. We didn't want to sing a song. How can we sing us the Lord's song in a foreign land? The psalmist wrote this, weeping may endure for the night, but hope, joy comes in the morning. God did bring them out of their captivity and, captivity and he did restore them. Hope tells us that difficult times will end. Hope tells us that it's going to remove the darkness of the heaviness of depression and you will one day wake up and not feel the weight of that thing on you anymore. I know I can speak of it. I've been through it. My wife's been through it. Depression can be defeated. It's not the end. It's not your portion. Hope is our light at the end of the tunnel. Amen. But it's also the light in the tunnel. We've got hope. Jesus doesn't say, well, you've got to get there before I'll help you. No, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you right now. I know what you're going through. Can I hear another amen? Amen. So whether it's hope for no weeping tomorrow, hope for something next week, or hope for the eternal glory that we will have in Christ Jesus, hope is something we all need. Why? Because hope is what keeps us going. Amen. Hope will keep you in your relationship with Jesus. Hope will keep your marriage together. Yes, we've had a rough week, but next week will be better. Hope will keep your business going. Yes, it's been a rough year, but I'm praying and I've been tithing and I've been giving. I've been obedient. I'm trusting God that he'll come through for me. Isn't that hope? Hope says I'm not feeling well now, but tomorrow I'll feel better. Hope says my situation feels hopeless and helpless, but I praise God I'm looking up because he lives. I can face tomorrow. That's hope, church. Let me tell you a few things about hope. We can have confident hope. We can have confidence in our hope. Do you have confidence in your hope, church? Do you have confidence in Jesus and what he's done for you? Let me go back to that scripture that I read earlier on. Hebrews 6 verse 18, 19, 2, 19. But I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation this time. Listen to this. So God has given us both. He's given us two things. His promise and his oath. I wrote an encouragement about it this week. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence. Say it with me. Great confidence. Let's personalize. Say, I have confidence. As we hold to the hope that lies before us, this hope 
is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Okay, so our hope is based on certain concrete facts. Things that nothing can change. Our hope is based on God's promise of salvation. God promised us if we saved, we will inherit eternal life. Can I hear an amen? If God promises something, is he going to break his promise? That same scripture said it's impossible for God to lie. So God gave us his promise and then he sealed it with something else, even more, even bigger than his promise. He made an oath. He made, don't take an oath easily, simply, okay? Because we tend to break our oath and God holds us responsible. But God gave us an oath. That means it will never, ever change. He made an oath. That's it. Clark. It cannot change. He, he gave us the promise in Hebrews 6 verse 9, it says, Dear friends, we are confident that you are meant for better things. Say it with me. I'm meant for better things. Those things come with salvation. And he gave us his oath that he will never change his mind regarding his promise to us of salvation. That comes from Hebrews 6, 17. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he will never change change his mind. If you're saved, church, don't ever doubt it. God's not going to change his mind about your salvation. Isn't that exciting? Can we give him praise for that? Bless you, Lord. So our hope is built on the fact that it is not possible for God who gave us his promise and his oath to lie. God can't lie. Do you believe God's promise and his oath? Amen. Yes. Connor, I didn't even have to think about it. Some of you are nodding. You don't even have to think about it. You don't have to think about it. Because God gave us that. Now, this was the beginning of my message. Just found its place somewhere further down. Hope is our anchor. I want to tell you we prayed about something on Monday night. And when I talk about it, they will nod. They will nod, those that were there. Again, from the Amplified. Now we have this hope as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. It cannot slip. It cannot break down under whatever steps on it. A hope that reaches further and enters into the very certainty of the presence within the veil. Have you ever been to the sea, Cape Town or Durban, or maybe another harbor, and you've seen the ships that dock outside the harbor? They don't dock in the... They, they, they don't dock. They, they wait. They throw anchor. Because the harbors are busy and they've got to wait for their turn. Durban Harbor, there's a queue down the north coast. In Cape Town, I'm quite sure it's the same. In Port Elizabeth, probably the same. And there's this queue of ships. They throw their anchor down. The waves come. The wind blow. The swells come. The currents flow. Do those ships get washed off, of course? Washed onto the shore? Washed out to sea. No, they don't, because the anchor holds. That's what an anchor does. It holds that ship, that huge ship. That anchor holds it in its place. Now, you know what hope does? It anchors us all. It anchors us in our faith. Hope will cause us not to backslide. Did you know that, church? Hope is what causes you not to backslide. If I've got doubts about my future and I'm not confident about what God's offering me, it would be much easier for me to drift off and start living a carnal and a worldly life again. If things go wrong, to say, ah, oh, God is not going to come through for me. But hope is my anchor. It anchors my soul. It anchors your very eternity. Hope. What we need to do is throw that anchor down and let us, mm, hakfas. No matter what happens, our hope keeps us anchored in Christ. The hope we have can be trusted not to fail us. It's called sure and steadfast in that scripture. Sure and steadfast. It prevents us from losing our faith when we face difficulties and adversity. Because you see, I spoke to a friend of mine yesterday. <laughs> he wrote to me, they're running around with their, their one daughter is doing quite well. Interesting, Maraca. She's doing gymnastics. And they also went to Portugal. <laughs> Maybe they're on the same plane as you a couple of weeks ago. I don't know what's happening in Portugal. Anyway, so now they're doing gymnastics, and he, he said something about drama. I said, oh, dear. 
But he was talking about them doing a drama. <laughs> and then I was, it was his birthday yesterday, and so I was speaking to him, and his wife was on, I was on a voice. And we spoke about problems, and he said what we, and I think she said, what we must remember is we're on a journey. This place we're in is temporary. No matter what you face, difficulties, trials, dramas, remember, it's only part of the journey. Church, we've got to finish this journey. Then we get to the destination where our ultimate hope of glory sits. Can I hear an amen? And if we can just bring things into context. We worry about all these things. In fact, even like my friend who was running off these children, we do this for our children. We, we run ourselves silly. We get a job and we work day and night as slaves for a corporation. And one day, this body's tired time to retire. We've abused it so it's not well anymore. We forgot. We've given everything to now instead of focusing on the end goal. Does that make sense to you? It's not all about the stuff happening in your life right now. It's about the future. We've got an eternity. This like, journey, there's a spot of fluff here on the red, yeah, and I often use that as an example. This fluff, when compared to the, the red carpet in this church, it's minuscule. It's like this life we're living right now. It's like short. Eternity. Remember Pastor Peter that one morning, he had a line that he put here, and he marked it. And he said, this little piece is your life now, but this whole string is eternity. This is the problem. We base our hope on what we experience here and now. We're going through a little problem today, or maybe a year or two of trouble here on this earth. And we lose we lose perspective of eternity and the fact that we're on a journey, a journey. But you know what the wonderful thing is? God's promise, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. If you're going through difficulty today, he's interested in this patch because it prepares us for that patch. Amen. He's going to help you to have victory in this patch. When we have hope, the enemy can't pull us down using negative circumstances. Nothing can move us. Our hope will keep us focused, steadfast, and secure in our faith. When we are willing to step out onto the platform of hope, it leads us right into the reality of God's presence in glory in the Holy of Holies in heaven. What awaits ahead is better than what lies behind. Let me ask you this question. Is your hope anchor deployed or are you aimly, aimlessly drifting about, backslidden in a world of hopelessness and depression? Where is your hope today, church? Is your anchor out? Is your anchor out? What is the key to retaining your hope? And this is what we prayed about on Monday night. And we've seen it in the church, and not just in this church, but all over in Christianity. Hebrews 6 verse 19, Paul is writing. Well, they, they think it's Paul that wrote the Hebrews. They're not sure about it. But whoever wrote the Hebrews says, Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts. How long must we love others? As long as I'm doing this. Amen? As long as we're breathing, right? Listen to this. In order to make certain that what you hope for will come true, what is the key to fulfilling our hope? It's an interesting answer, isn't it? Loving others for as long as we live. Loving others is the key to retaining your hope, church. Say that with me. Loving others is the key to retaining my hope. Now, sit up and take notice of what I'm about to say, because that scripture's not done yet, Okay? Just, just double check that scripture reference. I actually think it's Hebrews 6 verse 11 because then it says 12 here <laughs> as I've copied it in. Then you will become, sorry, then you will not become. So if we keep loving others as long as life lasts in order to make sure that what we hope for will come true, then it says this, then if, you see it's an if and then statement, then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. We prayed about the church, the people in the church, about indifference, about not caring, 
a no-care attitude. People are indifferent. Christians are indifferent. How do you prevent yourself from becoming dull and indifferent in your Christianity? By walking in love. Can I hear an amen? amen? The Lord gave me to the answer, the answer. I read this on Tuesday morning. It was the answer to a prayer we prayed on Monday night. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the examples of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. Hope endures. Hope is faith. Hope is there if we carry on walking in love. Otherwise, you're going to become dull and indifferent in your faith. In church, this is the problem in the church. It's the problem in the church. The church has become dull. I'm not saying this church. I'm talking about the church in general. But Christians have become dull and indifferent. And you know why? What did Jesus say is the most important commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. Because our love for our Father is built up in it. The whole word is built up in it. The law is in it. You need to walk in love. You need to walk in love. Walking in love says... I see somebody that is walking and heading towards a damnation, eternity without Jesus. If I love that person enough, I will put my shyness and myself aside and I will speak to that person and say there's a better way. That's love. Amen. Love says I treat my brother and the sister in the church kindly, gently, with patience. I walk with forgiveness. I bear with my brother and sister in love. Amen. Amen. Love says I love God enough to actually be diligent in attending services. Be diligent in study of His Word. Be diligent in prayer. Be diligent in, in doing my very best to live a righteous life. That's love. Love says I treat my husband or my wife right. I treat my children right. I treat my co-workers right. I treat my staff right. I treat my boss right. I treat the person that's annoying me and irritating me right. Love does that. The church is struggling because they become indifferent and cold and dull in their faith because they've lost the zeal to love. Go and read the book of 1, 2, and 3 John, where John writes about the imperative to love. It's imperative that we love. So if we were asking ourselves questions, but why is everybody indifferent? We do all of these things, we preach all these words, but people don't change what we need to start praying. Leaders, we need to start praying that the church will love one another. And with love, others. Jesus used the example of the Good Samaritan. And who were the first two? They were clerics. They were clerics. They walked past that guy. And the guy that was despised, the Samaritan person, the Jews didn't even eat with him. He found that person. He took money out of his own pocket. He cared for that person. Came back and checked if that person was okay. That's the picture Jesus drew for us in the parable. Do we walk like that, church? If we will, and what, is, what did he say? That we will spend all of our days walking in love. Then we will not lose hope. The reality is, you can have as much hope as you like. But if you're not walking in love, you can just kiss that hope goodbye. Mwah. Because you're going to become dull and indifferent. Because you do not walk in love. So it's actually a condition. If you want to have hope, you better have love. Can I hear an Amen. That was the only difficult part of this entire message, okay? The rest is all encouraging. But even that is encouraging, isn't it? Because doesn't it challenge you to say, okay, I better walk in love in a better way. I'm done, almost done now, okay? And then he said, then we will be like those who walk with faith and endurance. If we walk with love, we will have faith and we will have endurance. Is there evidence in your life that you are walking in love towards others? This is so important if we want to experience that for which we are hoping, church. I'm not going to read this section, but I'll I'll read you the verse. Our hope is alive. Hope is a living thing. 1 Peter 1 verse 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten, he's got hold of for us again, to a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. What is a living hope? A living hope is something that we have because our Savior lives. Because Jesus lives, we live also. We've got a living hope. Our hope is not something that's dead. All these other religions, they go and they look at the grave site where the prophet was buried or whatever. You go and look at the grave of Jesus Christ. The stone's been rolled away. There's no bones in that tomb. He's with Father in heaven, in glory. Our hope is alive. It's not dead. I want to conclude with this scripture. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of grace, uh, thought, sorry, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Listen to this. To give you a future and a hope. God's plan for you and I is a future and a hope. Friends, I want to encourage you this morning. The best is still to come. No matter what you're facing, you've got hope to anchor your soul, to keep your, your faith sure and steadfast. And in the trials and challenges that we face every day, we must take care not to lose the hope that God has given us. Because that hope will anchor us and cause us not to drift or stray. Can I hear an amen? And then I want to encourage you, walk in love. Ask the Lord to show you. Make it part of your prayer every morning. Say, Lord, help me to walk in love today. Because by doing so, you're making sure that that which you're hopeful will actually occur. If we can't walk in hope, if we can't walk in love, we've got no hope. We have to walk in love, church. We need to remember that our hope is something that's alive. It's not dead. So my challenge to you this morning is, do you have hope? Are you walking in the hope that is yours in Christ Jesus? Do you have that sure and steadfast anchor for your soul? Have you been drifting a little bit, church? I want to challenge those that are battling with depression. Depression is something that will come. It's like a dark blanket that comes and falls on a person. It's like a garment. It falls on a person. It will rob you of your hope. Depression will make you want to end it all. I don't have hope, so why do I bother to live? Amen? I bind that spirit. It's a dark spirit. I bind it in Jesus' name. I take authority over it in Jesus' name. I curse that thing and I command it to leave this place. And every person that's here this morning, it's got no place in your life, Christian. Take authority over that. Take hold of your hope. Let Jesus be your light in the tunnel. Because there is light at the end of the tunnel. You look better tomorrow than what you do right now. You've got a better future. I know the plans I have for you to give you a future and a hope. Let's stand, church. If you're not a born-again child of God, church, you've got no hope. Then people are going to mourn for you as those who have no hope. If that's you this morning, you want to give your heart to Jesus with every eye closed. So that you can make a personal decision. If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning, say, I want that hope that comes from being a child of God. Why don't you just lift your hand up like this? If that's you, just lift up your hand. Amen. I see a hand. I see anybody else who can take that hand down. Is there anybody else? All right, we're going to just pray. We're going to pray a general prayer. Let's just pray this together. Father God, we have heard this morning of the hope that we can have in you. I want to experience that hope. I want Jesus Christ to be my hope of glory. So Lord Jesus, I invite you to dwell in me so that I can say, Christ in me, my hope of glory. I make the confession by faith today that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Father, that you raised him from the dead in the power of your spirit. And he's seated in heaven at your right hand. And I'm seated with him, a child of God. I confess that and I believe it. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. And now I want to ask you, church, if you feel that you've lost your hope, if you're feeling that you're struggling with the heaviness of depression or just battling through days, if you feel that you've lost hope in a certain circumstance, situation, maybe you, your healing, your health, or your marriage, it can be anything. If you've just lost hope, if you're just battling to, to have perspective about even thinking about tomorrow, I want to ask you, and I'm going to ask you to come forward I'll ask the leaders to pray for you again. I'm not going to come too close to you. But if that's you today, just come to the front here. We're going to cut that thing off. Is there anybody? Is there anybody that would come forward here and just hand that cloak of depression, take it off and set it aside? Anybody? This morning. I don't see anybody getting up. Well, that's fine. Come, my brother, come. I knew I didn't have this message for nothing. I said, have you been encouraged this morning, church? Amen. I'm going to ask if, if, if the brothers here will pray for you. I just don't want to come too close. And uh, I want to just tell somebody here this morning, anybody who, who this is for. I've been feeling this for some time. I've got a jacket on this morning. I feel that, that depression is like a jacket. It's like something you're wearing. It's something that's squashing you and too tight and, and it's just doing this to you and Jesus says I want to take the thing off to you I want to take it off of you and I want to set it aside I want to set it aside I want to take that feeling of of like you've just closed in um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word you're feeling claustrophobic it's so heavy Jesus says I want you to take it and set it aside I've actually walked away from my jacket he wants to free you from that thing this morning. That, for somebody here this morning. So let's, let's just close our eyes and we're going to pray. And then we'll ask these gentlemen to minister. Kirsty will lead us in a song. And I'll greet you at the back. Our Lord, we want to just thank you that you are our hope. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that in you, tomorrow is better. I look better tomorrow than what I do right now. And in my future, I look much better than what I do right now. Because Christ in me is my hope of glory. We thank you that we have hope as a steadfast anchor for our soul. It's sure and steadfast. We will not drift because our hope is in you. And I pray, Lord, that bit which I spoke about, about love. Without love, we will drift. We will become dull and indifferent. We repent of our lack of love. And we pray, Lord, teach us how to love like you love. We ask for victory as we go out of this church now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. All right, as they pray, we're going to sing, and then we're going to close. Tomorrow. 